Okay, welcome back. Happy Friday. We are so excited to be here. Even though it's a muggy, yucky day here in New York, I am sure someone in the world somewhere is enjoying absolutely amazing weather. Welcome back to our Friday, every Friday at noon edition of Women's Health Weekly. Every week we bring you information from experts that applies to women health, women's health that you can use, that's practical. We give you an opportunity to ask questions live and get them answered by experts from around the world. And this week, from New York City only, this week we have with us, and we're so excited, Dr. Jamie Glick, who is a clinical assistant professor of dermatology at New York Presbyterian, Weill Cornell. We are absolutely honored to have her here. And my longtime colleague, Dr. Nicole Ostrov, who is a gynecologist who has been working for Maiden Lane Medical with us for about the past nine years. We have an all-star team today, fantastic opportunities to answer all of your questions. We have a great lineup of topics, and I'll say it from the outset, and maybe you'll hear me say it three, three or four more times throughout our telecast today. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, please, where we love bringing you this content. We love bringing you this information. And once this telecast is over, it will be available on replay on our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Maiden Lane Medical. The uh, content will also be broken up into small, smaller clips uh, that will uh, be more easily watchable of about five to seven minutes. Shan, one of our YouTube viewers, thank you very much. Hello, how are you? Thanks for joining us. So I just want to, I want to get started here. I want to jump right into it. We're talking about your skin today. Uh, and, the, and the people that talk to about your skin are dermatologists. They are experts in your skin. And so far as I remember from medical school, which by the way, for all of you listening, was about 25 years ago for me, um, more maybe. Um, as far as I recall, the skin is the largest organ in your body. Is that still true or has it shrunk? It has, it like, <laughs> has it gone down in rank? That is still true. Okay, good. So, so I just had an expert dermatologist from New York City confirm that, in fact, 25 years later, the skin is still the largest organ in your body. It is ranked number one. Um, let's talk about dermatologists and what dermatologists do. To my understanding, there are two main areas in dermatology, um, cosmetic dermatology, uh, which, in, which you can tell us about in a moment, and then there's medical dermatology. So what do, what do cosmetic dermatologists do mainly? So I, I would correct you and say there's like three main areas of dermatology, I cosmetic corrected. and surgical. Um, we do do no skin cancer treatments of anyone. Um, so cosmetic dermatologists focus on making us more beautiful. Um, so we focus on Botox, filler, laser, skin quality, skin texture. I mean, it's, it's a really vast field. I specialize in cosmetic and medical dermatology. I feel there's a lot of overlap. Like, let's say you have an acne patient. A lot of acne patients complain about acne, but even when I clear up their acne, they start to complain about the dark spots or the leftovers and the scars. So sometimes that's even more concerning than the acne itself. So there's a lot of overlap between the medical and the cosmetic aspects of dermatology. So you do both. I do both. I okay. do both. I do. Yes. It's my favorite part. I can do it all. You know, the patient comes in, they want us to clear their skin. We can clear their skin from acne. Then we can clear their skin from the, you know, the marks and the scars. And it's really rewarding to be able to do the whole spectrum. So Dr. Ostrov and I have a lot of experience with that, and we're really happy that we're able to offer in gynecology surgical and medical treatments to patients. So it kind of gives us a full spectrum of being able to offer what they need. Before we move on and talk about some medical dermatology issues, I wanted to let everybody know that none of us on this telecast have any interest in any of the products we're going to mention. We may talk about some products. Every week we talk about products. That's not going to change. Uh, there are some products that as physicians we genuinely endorse 
for your use. Uh, we think they're great. There are some products that we'll mention that we don't think are so great. But any products, please understand that we mention on this telecast, we have no financial interest in and uh, we gain nothing from mentioning them other than to offer you expert information and help you along your way. So let's talk about one of the most common things I believe we see together, um, which is acne. Let's talk about acne. What is acne? So acne is basically a disease of what we call the pilosebaceous unit. So it's basically the muscle, the hair, in the sebaceous gland. Um, so I actually trained under Dr. Alan Shalita, who is the world's expert on acne. He basically identified the pathophysiology of acne. Um, and we're still actually, as common as acne is, we're still trying to understand what causes acne. Um, but I usually tell my patients it's a combination of four factors, basically four plus, I say. So clogged pores, or something called hyperkeratinization, inflammation, um, oil glands, or overgrowth of the sebaceous glands, and bacteria. And all of those mixed together basically to form an acne lesion. So, I so we actually use the word acne to describe even one lesion. So acne is just even one pimple. Okay, so I need an explanation from you of something that's been on my mind for a while. Um, so I had a lot of acne as a kid, and I know a lot of women also have acne as a kid in their teen years. Um, when they hit puberty, uh, acne tends to increase so far as I understand. Isn't that supposed to stop at some point? You would think. Um, so you I would like, say... Right? You'd like that to stop. Yeah. I get that in my office all the time. Like, I'm not a teenager anymore. What's going on? I would actually say the most common person in my office for acne is a 20 to 30 something year old young female. They are the most common. I don't know, you know, when I was in training, I felt like everyone was a little bit younger, but I don't know. I think there's like this explosion of acne in, in young people. Um, I don't know if this will offend you guys um, as gynecologists, but I think that there is a big association between hormonal acne and IUDs. I always joke to my patients that sometimes, you know, the Mirena and Skyla IUDs keep me in business. <laughs> hold it, hold it. That's, that's not only, hold it, that's not only not offensive, that we're seeing the same thing. But here's the difference is that there's a, there's in medicine uh, for the YouTube viewers, there's something called an observation bias. Um, so sometimes you see something and you think it's more common uh, because you're only seeing a subset of that population. So Dr. Click, you're totally right. We definitely see more acne in women who have the progesterone containing hormone IUDs than women who have non-hormone containing IUDs or are on nothing. And here's the reason why. It's because the progesterone levonorgestrel, which is a hormone inside that IUD, the, the hormone has some what are called androgenic side effects. And some women tolerate those androgenic side effects very well. And androgenic side effects are things that give you a testosterone-like side effect. So things that would make your skin oily, your hair oily, make you potentially gain weight, um, and give you some acne are typical androgenic side effects that we see. The reason you think it's so common is because those are the only patients you're seeing with hormone related or probably other than maybe polycystic ovary syndrome patients, the only patients you're really seeing with hormone related acne is the, are the ones with the IUDs. The, but the real data is that we only see it about 5% uh, in, in about 5% of women who, who have hormone containing IUDs. You're seeing 100% of those 5% of women. That's what that's yeah, the observation yeah. bias. Go ahead, Dr. Ostro. No, I, I was just going to add in too that sometimes there's also the bias of there's a lot of women that um, stop their oral contraceptive that actually can be beneficial for their acne, which I'm sure Dr. Wood would agree with, because a lot of those progesterones can be more anti-testosterone, and they've switched from the pill to the IUD. So a lot of them have that bias too, um, because they've stopped something that was actually helpful for them and started this IUD that does have this, you know, a little bit more androgenic activity. Got it. I agree with you, actually. I think patients tend to come in more because 
they never had acne and now suddenly they do and they want to go to the dermatologist even more so than necessarily someone who's been struggling with it for most of their life. That's an interesting sort of scenario. And I'm really glad you brought that up because last week, Dr. Ostrov and I had this whole conversation about um, contraception. And we, we realized that it was a much bigger topic. The acne, acne in association with or without certain types of contraception was a really interesting topic to talk about. And I think from our standpoint, from a general, you know, both cosmetic standpoint and social standpoint and feeling about yourself standpoint, patients should really know that um, there's a five or so percent chance that the hormone that contain, that's contained in their hormone containing IUD is going to lead to adverse skin effects. I think that's a really important counseling point. I absolutely agree. I also think that a lot of times patients get on the IUD so they don't have to take a pill, right? That's one of the common areas. And then they come into my office and then sometimes I have to start them on or an lactone or an antibiotic or another pill and it's kind of like replacing one pill for another pill so i definitely think educating them that you know if that's the primary reason you may want to consider something else you know just talking about all their options i i sometimes do prescribe birth control by my for for my own patients but oftentimes i'll send them first to a gynecologist especially if they've never been evaluated before because you guys are certainly the experts on on all the different options out there Sometimes. Okay, so so I'm a 24-year-old woman. I mean, I'm not a 24-year-old woman, but let's just set the scenario that I'm a 24-year-old woman and I have perfect skin. Or what I, I love my skin. My skin's great. It's, it's, it's awesome. Um, what can I do um, to prevent potential acne outbreaks? And how, and how, how would I, am I at risk for suddenly getting acne? What's the, what are the answers to some of that? How do I, how do I prevent it? So, um, it's hard to imagine me as a 24 year old girl, but I'm trying. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so I think that there's like a couple of questions there. So one is how to prevent acne and two is how to just keep your skin beautiful and young for a long period of time. And that's where the medical cosmetic dermatology overlap happens basically every day for every patient in my office. So, in terms of acne, um, I would say, you know, if you're not prone to acne, the f fastest way to get you prone to acne is to use comedogenic products. So that means products that are going to clog your pores. So a lot of times I see my younger patients wanting to use a lot of anti-aging products, even though they're only, you know, 24. And I understand and really respect the you know, preventative measures, but sometimes they're then using products that are designed for older patients, you know, potentially their mother's moisturizer or serum that doesn't really factor in that younger people may be prone to acne. And then they end up putting on these very thick, heavy products and then suddenly developing clogged pores and acne. So like we talked about before, there are four plus things that cause acne and hyperkeratinization or clogged pores is one of the primary ones. So I think that that's one, making sure that you use products that are appropriate to your skin. And that's really hard to know because there's so much information out there. I mean, the skincare market, especially now, is just booming. Um, I think that talking to your dermatologist and trying things out are the best ways to really know. Um, in terms of keeping your skin young, the number one thing is sunscreen, even if you're indoors. Um, I t I'm wearing my sunscreen right now. I hope you um, really? are as well. So especially if you're near a window, UVA light actually is light that can come in through even a closed window, and that actually can damage collagen and cause aging. So broad spectrum sunscreens that prevent against UVA and UVB light um, are really important, even when you're sitting in your home, like most of us are doing these days. Dr. Ostroff, did you know that? I didn't. I had no idea. I mean, I, I always do wear sunscreen, uh, you know, as, as I get a little bit older, um, I'm a little bit more aware of my skin and take better care of it than I did in my 20s. Um, but I had no idea. But I think, you know, I think a lot of women now do are a little bit 
more cognizant about using the moisturizers with sunscreen, using the foundations with sunscreens. But I had no idea, even when you're driving, I guess, too, then, right? Totally, especially on your hands. Because a lot of times people put sunscreen on their face and they forget about their hands. And if you have that wheel, then your hands can age you a lot. Oftentimes we can say, we can tell the age of a woman by her neck, chest, and hands, not even her face, because people tend to apply more moisturizers and sunscreen to the face. Going back to 24-year-old Ken, um, I also think a retinoid, using a retinoid, as long as you're not actively trying to become pregnant or currently pregnant, is a great way to kill two birds. One is um, preventing acne, because retinoids can decrease the size of the sebaceous gland or oil glands, and they can also unclog pores. And they're also um, one of the only topical medicines to promote collagen growth. So that is an excellent way to do multiple things. And it's they're even at over the counter retinoids and retinols now. Are there some really great products that you think about when you think about a great over the counter product with retinoids in them? So I think that there are a million of them. <laughs> Probably, um, right. I think that, um, you know, Differin or Adapalene is the first ever prescription strength retinoid that's available over the counter. So a lot of times, because insurance can often give us a difficult time in retinoids, a lot of times I'll, if I can't get a tretinoin or a Tazerac, which are higher strength retinoids applied for my patients or covered by their insurance, I'll just recommend they start over the counter Differin or Adapalene because they can get that. It's a little confusing though, because Differin now has like a whole brand of products. They have sunscreens and moisturizers. And so a lot of times when I say Differin, I'll get an email from my patient and I'll have like nine different photos of different products. But Adapalene gel is the generic name of, of what you'd be looking for in that case. Um, back to acne very quickly. Um, just from a standpoint of prevention, are there any foods or nutritional aspects uh, to one's lifestyle that may either worsen acne, bring on acne, or even help prevent acne? So yes, there are some studies. I firstly always like to say that I think a lot of this is individual. So sometimes I have patients who tell me every single time I eat a slice of pizza, I get a pimple. Or every single time I go on a plane, I get a pimple. So I do think that we all have individual things that can stress out our skin, increase inflammation to our skin, and thus, you know, increase bacteria growth and make acne. Um, but just generally speaking in the studies, typically skim milk has been associated with higher levels of acne and so have high glycemic foods. So foods that can spike your blood sugar and insulin-like growth factor that can then exacerbate the growth of your sebaceous glands can all cause acne. So you know, the things that make you healthy are the things that make your skin healthy too, you know? That makes, that makes so much sense. I mean, all of those things that you're talking about, um, cow's milk for some people, uh, foods that are high in the glycemic index, right? Things that spike your blood sugar are going to be things that are generally unhealthy for you and make you gain weight and have other adverse effects on your body. And right, so I guess the keep your body healthy, keep your skin healthy. Is that the message? Mm -hmm. Exactly. We have a great question from one of our YouTube viewers going back to the conversation about sunscreen. And I think it's actually a really insightful question. Does, don't we, don't we need sunlight for vitamin D production? Mm -hmm. And knowing that, does sunscreen block the level of the, ben the, sun the, the natural sunlight benefit for vitamin D production? So, you know, this is a question that dermatologists are often asked. Um, so you do get a certain percentage of vitamin D from the sun. You only need about 10 to 20 minutes outside. The UVB light that gets onto your skin can make vitamin D. It's kind of weighing the balance, I think, um, especially now there's a lot of talk about vitamin D and the coronavirus and your immune system. So I think it depends on what time of day you choose to go outside, what you're prone to sunburn is. And also there are a lot of supplements now that you can take for vitamin D. So 
you know, if you're out for 10, 20 minutes to get your vitamin D, that I get that you only need that amount of time. But if you're out for three, four hours, you know, you got well more vitamin D than you needed that day, specifically from the sun, but you got a lot more sun damage in those extra, you know, three and a half hours. That's a great, that's great. I want to um, just kind of move on to the to the next set of topics, if that's, have we, have we gotten, have we talked about acne enough? Does anyone have any additional items to talk about with regard to acne? Doctor, do you have any well, questions we, for Dr. Ost, for Dr. Glick, Dr. Ostroff? Well, I think um, the, the only other thing I was going to say is maybe to mention, because I even get this question a lot, is um, the SPF, the SPF number on those sunscreen bottles. And is the higher you go better? And at what would you cap that number at? Because I even get that question a lot. So it's really interesting you would say that. And my answer would have been different a week ago than it is today. Yeah. Um, okay. So typically, I would tell my patients, SPF 30 or the sun protection factor number is really what you should focus on um, because or you get about 98% of sun protection rays being prevented at SPF 30. That goes down to about 93 at SPF 15. And, you know, I always tell my patients, like, as doctors, we like to get an A, not an A minus. So we want to be at the 98 and not at the 93. However, a recent study in the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology that just came out actually showed that SPF um, of 100 may actually be better than SPF 50. Um, and then it might give you more prolonged sun protection. That was a, a brand new controversial study because typically we don't say that. I, I literally just read that when I was catching up on my journal articles like last week and I was like, hmm, I might have to change what I say. You're the first person to ask me since I've read that new article. Um, so I think in terms of sunscreen, I'm still going with an SPF of 30, but I think even more than that is when you put it on and how often you put it on. So, you know, a lot of times patients are like, Dr. Glick, I got sunburn, but I put my sunscreen on. I'm like, okay, did you put it on 20 minutes before you go out? And did you reapply every two hours? And, you know, it's hard to do that. You know, when you're reapplying sunscreen every hour and a half to two hours, it's like, feels like the whole day you're just applying sunscreen. But you really want to apply at least every two to four hours, especially, you know, after you come out of the, the water. All right, I have one more. I'm gonna. I have one more acne topic for you, um, and I know you wanted to talk about this, and it's very timely, and it's important because all of us are now wearing masks, um, mm -hmm. and those masks can be irritating, and they produce moisture in the in uh, beneath the mask. What What are your recommendations? Can 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 that lead to more acne? Can, what other other skin problems the masks can lead to? And if so, how do we prevent that? So yes, the skin mask can lead to a number of problems. Um, although I still think we should wear them, um, we can do it, you know, responsibly and in a great way to protect our skin. So um, because you're wearing a mask, you're trapping in moisture, and so there are a lot of skin conditions that worsen with a lot of moisture or sweating. So something called seborrheic dermatitis, which is a uh, scaly rash that happens oftentimes over here and over here, a lot of times right under the mask, we'll see that act up. Um, and definitely acne. So a lot of times I used to see acne in my young football players, like right under their um, helmets. They used to get acne there because of the compression of the follicle and also the sweat and the, and the dirt and the moisture there can all cause acne. And now we're seeing that similar concept with the mask. So I think a couple of quick tricks. Um, and obviously, if your acne gets so bad, and it's really disconcerting to you, I would see, you know, a dermatologist, and there's a lot of telemedicine and teledermatology you could do now. Um, but in terms of what you can do at home, number one is make sure that if you're using a reusable cloth mask, you're washing it as frequently as you can. Um, I also think a choice of a wash might be good. So using a face wash with a salicylic acid, so salicylic acids are keratolytic, so they basically can unclog your pores. So if you're using a mask every day that's clogging your pores, at least when you're washing your face, you can unclog your pores. So what I would do is use a sal acid wash like in the morning or at night. And then the other time of day, I would probably use a foaming cleanser. I don't always recommend foaming cleansers because they can often 
strip the skin barrier, but because you have a lot of extra moisture and stuff going on, you want to be extra cleansed. So I think a foaming cleanser is a good idea. And there's a lot of over-the-counter sal acid. I have no stock in Neutrogena, but they make a ton of different sal acids. But I don't want any of the ones with the beads. Um, those can actually inflame skin, and especially if your skin's already inflamed. So just a gentle sal acid wash and a gentle foaming cleanser too. Salicylic acid, stay away from the beads. Got it. it? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So we have a, another couple of acne questions. Well, we're going to save those for the end because I want to generally move on to some next topics. Thank you everyone for joining us on Women's Health Weekly, our, our skin issue with Dr. Jamie Glick, and who's a dermatologist, and Dr. Nicole Ostroff, who's a gynecologist. Uh, once again, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we come to you every week with uh, women's health uh, ad advice and information that comes from the experts uh, here in New York City and all around the world. So let's go ahead and move to uh, our next set of uh, co topics, which is really a little bit about some other skin problems. I think maybe we could talk about these together. The, ec the problem of eczema, which I understand to be very common, um, and dryness, which can come along with eczema as far as I understand. But you, but you I guess if there's correcting to be done, you, will, you should and, and will correct me. Um, so how common is, what is eczema um, and how common is it? So... I would say eczema is extremely common, especially these days. Um, eczema is more of like a all-encompassing term, and it really just means inflammation of the skin. There's lots of different causes of eczema. So atopic dermatitis is probably what most people think of when they think of eczema. It's like the little babies who have eczema. Um, then there's allergic contact dermatitis, which is just another um, cause of inflammation of the skin. I would say that these days, allergic contact dermatitis is extremely common. It's probably next to maskne, the most common thing I'm seeing on my telemedicine maskne, visit. that was great. <laughs> and um, pretty much related to all of the hand washing and all of the cleaning fluids that people are using now, you know, I think that people are trying really hard not to touch their face, but a lot of times because of the mask, people are touching their faces a lot. And so I'm seeing a lot of facial rashes or eczema on the face because whatever cleaning fluid or soap or fragrance you may have used on your hands, now you're touching your face. And a lot of times you're getting those rashes on your, your face. Interesting. Okay. So eczema isn't is a very sounds like it's a very broad group of symptoms or problems and i think doctors is probably probably as well as patients um use that terminology to describe those things because it's it's it's, an, it's easy we don't really know the difference exactly i mean it's kind of like colitis like it's just an inflammation all-encompassing term um, are there things that can be done to prevent symptoms associated with dry skin for example for sure. So um, dry skin and eczema are kind of overlapping, kind of different, but I think that um, oftentimes we can treat dry skin with just skin, good skin practices. Eczema we can often treat with good skin practices, but sometimes we have to take it to the next level and give like a prescription medicine for that. Um, in terms of ways to prevent both dry skin and eczema, I think that good skin care. So I'm not going to tell you not to wash your hands because we're all washing our hands and we should wash be. Wash your hands, please. <laughs> Best way to prevent the virus. But um, I always tell my patients, even before we were all hand washing as frequently as are, that you want to moisturize as often as you can after a hand washing. Um, because when you wash your hands and you use soap, you're trying to kill whatever's on your hands, but then you're also stripping your epidermis or stratum corneum, which is the top layer of your epidermis, which is your skin barrier. And so you're taking off a lot of what you would want there as well. And so you want to kind of replace that with a moisturizer. And a moisturizer specifically with something called ceramides in it is particularly good at moisturizing the skin. It helps replace the lipids that sometimes we kind of take off when we're using the soap. So there's a lot of products out there that have ceramides in them. Right. I think not that's not a word I'm familiar with, but now I am. Thank you, Dr. Glick. CeraVe is one of the classic um, moisturizers out there that have ceramides in them. It was probably one of the first ones. And now 
There's a lot of different ones. Another brand called Amlactin. They recently came out with their rapid repair formula, which also has ceramides in it. I think Purell also has a ceramides um, formula as well. I also think not using very hot water. So you don't want to use very hot water because that can also, when that hot water goes off your skin and evaporates, it takes extra water with it and makes you even drier as well. I've been telling people for years to wash with cold water, wash your hands with cold water only. And uh, the CDC hand washing guidelines actually going back forever never said anything about a temperature of the water. Um, so it's just as well to wash your hands from a bacteria and virus standpoint uh, with cold water as it is with hot water. So if there's a benefit to not using hot water, then that's it. Um, so I have a great question from one of our YouTube viewers. You know what else is really common that we see all the time that uh, Dr. Glick, I bet you see all the time, and I know Dr. Ostrov and I see this all the time because it's so incredibly common is our thyroid problems, problems with the thyroid and low levels of thyroid hormone. The question is, can thyroid issues cause eczema? Or are they associated? Because thyroid is an, an, auto, an autoimmune problem. Can that cause eczema or be associated with it? So not exactly eczema, I would say, but I would say dry skin for sure. Um, hypothyroidism has um, one of the primary symptoms or signs of hypothyroidism, which is an underactive thyroid, would be dry skin. Sometimes it's one of the first signs that we see. Interesting. So definitely. And um, I wouldn't say, you know, just because you have dry skin, you have to worry that you have hypothyroidism because it's definitely not the most common cause, but um, it's definitely seen in patients who have that. But it's a very reasonable reason to go to your primary care doctor, your gynecologist, to at least get a thyroid hormone level checked. And uh, if you have other things like fatigue and a little weight gain, those are things that also commonly go along with low levels or on a thyroid hormone or underactive thyroid gland. And those are important reasons to go get that those laboratory values completed. For sure. I would say one of the most common labs that I run in my office is a TSH check for people's thyroid for sure. Um, we have what's called like generalized puritis or generalized itching. So if someone comes in with like just diffusely dry skin and itchy skin, one of the tests that we run is for sure to check their thyroid. Got it. All right. So let's move on to something that I hope everyone is going to find really interesting and exciting. The um, topic of cosmetics and uh, not cosmetics, the makeup cosmetics, the cosmetic part of dermatology, because I don't wear any makeup, but I, I, I hope I can talk reasonably about cosmetic dermatology. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're here on YouTube Live with Women's Health Weekly with Dr. Jamie Glick, who's a, an expert dermatologist here in New York City and assistant clinical professor of dermatology at Wild Cornell in New York Presbyterian, and Dr. Nicole Ostrov, who is a gynecologist and with us here at Maiden Lane Medical. Um, once again, we're going to talk about some products potentially, but please understand that we have no financial interest in those products. We don't endorse them. And... Um, we don't, certainly don't make any money uh, when we do mention those product names. So I do want to talk about some of the cosmetic dermatology um, issues. And something we see very commonly in the office and get requests for all the time um, is uh, information about laser hair removal. Uh, I won't tell you my horror story that I had with a patient, um, but let's suffice to say that if I was going to recommend a hair removal technique, it would be laser hair removal over waxing. So talk to us about laser hair removal. How does that even work? Who, who should get it? Who shouldn't get it? So I think that, you know, it, it's a cost. So that's, you know, it's, it is an investment laser hair removal. But other than that, I think everyone with dark hair should consider it. Um, the way that laser hair removal works is basically um, the laser targets dark hair because the laser sees the melanin in your hair and it basically targets it and blows it away. Um, so we have lots of different lasers available now because if you have darker skin, you know, this laser will see your hair, but it will also see your skin. So we use special types of lasers depending on your skin color to make sure to try and target the hair and not the skin and discolor the skin. Um, I think it's really beneficial for, you know, the armpits and the groin area, especially for people who are prone to ingrown hairs and, you know, cysts. 
And there's also a condition, you know, hydroadenitis superativa, which I see a lot. I imagine you as gynecologists would also see that a lot too. And, oh, we you sure know, do. one of the patients is, is laser hair removal as well. What, what, what a terrible problem. If you're someone out there who suffers from hydroadenitis superativa or HA, as we commonly refer to it, um, the uh that's it can be devastating to your skin it can cause very severe scarring sometimes those those it creates tracks like tunnels through your skin and those can get infected uh so it can be a really very difficult problem um to deal with and we, we deal with that a lot at maiden lane medical okay so laser hair removal what if somebody also has dark skin does it then target their the mel the am I, am I using the right word melanin in there, yes. Does it also it does. so it targets the melanin in the hair follicle, but does it also target the melanin in the skin? So if you have dark skin, what happens when you do laser hair removal? So laser hair removal is slightly more difficult. We do have lasers that are more longer wavelengths, which can penetrate the skin deeper and protect the surface of the skin. Um, an example would be an ND YAG laser. So a lot of times that one will use on darker skin patients for laser hair removal. We do have to be just more careful. So a lot of times we'll have to start lower, you know, in medicine they say go low and slow. So a lot of times we'll do that. So if you are a patient who has darker skin, you may, you know, require a few more sessions just because you might, you know, we might need to go slower with that. We can't do laser hair removal on at, at this point on patients who have blonde hair or red hair because there's not enough, um, you know, dark melanin in the skin to target the laser. There are a lot of companies working on different methods of, you know, sending in gold particles and nanoparticles and other particles down to the follicle so the laser can see it and then blast those hairs. But as far as I know, we're not there yet. Interesting. Uh, since one of our YouTube viewers asked a, a great question, um, ap totally apropos to the current conversation. Um, uh, Sin Damon asked, uh, at, it, I'll, I'll sort of read it verbatim here. At home IPL devices, and I think IPL stands for intermittent pulse laser. Is that true? Actually, it stands for intense pulse light. Oh, so there you go. Intense pulse light. Thank you. So you've done, done a great oh. job of correcting me today. I appreciate it. So she's, she's, she asked the question that at home, these at home devices are more common, are becoming more common, and wants to know, and knows that it's advised not to use them on moles or freckles, but also noted that there aren't really great specific instructions about um, how to work around moles and freckles or even how to use, um, maybe even how to use the devices. So can it be used right next to a mole? What would be the consequences? And do you have any advice about that with regard to IPL, home IPL devices? Intense so I feel intense pulse light, right? So a laser, the, the difference between the two is that a laser is one wavelength of light and intense pulse light would be multiple wavelengths in one. Um, intense pulse light can be used based on the wavelength that you set it at to treat red spots, to treat brown spots, and also to do laser hair removal. Um, so, you know, the fear is, is that if we laser a mole, which typically moles have melanin in them, right, which is the target of these lights and lasers, that you could potentially discolor it, you know, alter its features, and in a worst case scenario, um, you know, morph it into becoming a skin cancer. I think that, that a lot of that is theoretical. I think that, you know, we try our best in the office, you know, and, and at home I would try your best to avoid the mole, but I think that's the primary reason why they want you to stay clear because those, those often have a lot of melanin too that you might end up burning yourself because the more melanin in the area, the more the laser sees and the more intense the laser reaction. So if you have an area where you have a very large mole, that laser can tend to see that and, and burn it. So I would just say being as careful as you as you can be. Yeah, so it's my understanding that, that while there are a lot of non-medical people trained and perfectly capable of using these laser devices, um, there's still danger there and you could certainly create a significant burn on your skin if it's done incorrectly. Absolutely. I think that, you know, it depends on your state and, and you know, certain states, New York, interestingly enough, is a it's much less regulated state for at least lasers than other places. Um, New Jersey is a very heavily regulated state when it comes to lasers. Um, so 
I think who can operate a laser is, is dependent on state, but you want to make sure that, you know, whoever is operating the laser knows how to operate it and also what to do if things go wrong. Because even in the best hands, you can have mistakes. Um, you know, a lot of times I get calls, I think for as dermatologists, our most frustrating issue is when we get calls from patients who are getting laser hair removal or, or other treatments outside of our office, but then when the mistake happens, they're referred to our office. And, you know, that's a little scary because if you're able to perform the treatment, then you should also be able to fix or at least manage a problem. You know, there are certain things that would be beyond the scope and, you know, in that case, a dermatologist, but I would personally feel safer going to someone if something went wrong, that they would know what to do when that happened as well. And I think that's the that's a, a, a great expert message because when you put your healthcare in the hands of expert trained physicians and people who've maybe they've been fellowship trained or who have years and years of supervision instead of a ten hour course uh, under their belt, uh, you're less likely to run into these problems in the first place, and then you won't have to get that extra referral or waste that extra time or have that extra pain or or have that burn on your skin. And you're right, Dr. Glick, mistakes um, and bad outcomes occur even with physicians. So the patients aren't, aren't, aren't completely 100% protected, but the likelihood that there's gonna be a problem when you do this procedure with somebody with a higher level of training, then you're less likely to have a problem. And that person will also be more likely to know what to do immediately um, to prevent yep. further problems if there's an, if there's an issue associated uh, with that procedure. Okay, Interesting. Um, in that vein, Oh, I just wanted to say one more thing. So, interesting laser hair removal, I think, is the number one malpractice cosmetic case that um, people deal with. And I think about over 90% of the cases are non physician performing the procedure. So, I think that goes to show, you know, how many, how having an expert is, is important. Interesting. So, the, the medical malpractice data. Um, sometimes is instructive to us about what's going on out there outside of our medical community and what mistakes are, are and harm is being done. Um, so while we're on this conversation about experts um, and who can do what, I, I noticed there's a lot of people out there giving Botox. Uh, Botox parties for, with your local RN, um, Botox this, Botox that. Um, I, I know a lot about Botox because we do Botox treatments for very severe pelvic floor muscle spasm. Um, and we've been doing it for more than a decade. We've had a tremendous amount of success with it. We've, we've had, we have literally like a 0.002% rate of, of adverse outcomes. It's so incredibly rare for something bad to happen in our office because we're, you know, we're, we have experience with it. But what happens when somebody goes to get Botox um, with somebody who's not a professional and they put it in the wrong place or they put too much of it in, what, what could happen there? And how, would, how do you prevent that? So I think that as a dermatologist, this is a particularly sensitive topic. Um, what people don't realize as board certified dermatologists and also as board certified plastic surgeons that we actually learn this stuff in residency. And so a lot of times I'll tell, you know, a friend of mine who goes to a nurse or, you know, someone else who's injecting, and they seem to be often very surprised that we actually are trained throughout our residency in these procedures. And also, you know, they're actually on our board exam. So we have to be certified in many ways on these procedures. So um, I think that's the value in seeing um, a board certified dermatologist or a board certified plastic surgeon, because we've had multiple years, you know, and not just weekend courses or, you know, one other doctor kind of showing us what to do, you know, on a weekend. We have like rigorous, you know, structured training and then tested on it. Um, I think of all cosmetic procedures that I do, um, I think Botox is one of the safest. I actually think laser hair removal and especially IPL, that intense pulse light, is actually among the most dangerous of procedures because of the risk of burn and scarring. Um, I think that um, the, you know, attention to detail and the way that you understand facial anatomy and facial structure. And I think that board certified dermatologists and board certified plastic surgeons, you know, spend their career studying facial anatomy and facial structure. And so 
no one's going to know it better than them, you know? Um, so, you know, the way that we tweak the muscle and we put a little bit of Botox here, a little bit there, I think is really, um, can alter your face, you know? I mean, this is your face we're talking about. So to me, it's not just Botox, you know, because if your eyebrow position is now out of position for the next three months, you know, that's not, that's not how you want to look at yourself in the mirror, you know, for the next three months. So I think that, you know, it's important to go whoever, you know, nurse, NP, PA, or MD, whoever you go to for any of these things, it's important to trust them and know that they know their anatomy and that they um, come from a reputable place. Thank you. So I, so we're getting close to the end here. Um, I have one last question that kind of wraps up a lot of the conversation we've been having. Uh, comes from Deborah, one of our YouTube viewers. She asks, "What is a what? This is a, this is a great like sort of general question, and I think you touched on a lot of this. Um, but if you could give like a one and a half minute wrap up of the information, what is a good moisturizer, diet, and vitamins for aging, dry skin? So I guess if for women who are getting to menopause, women who are maybe in their 40s and experiencing some of the symptoms associated with perimenopause or, the perimenopause or that time around when you start to experience hormonal changes or decrease ovarian function, and then your body starts to change a little bit. So the question from Deborah is, what is a good moisturizer diet and vitamins potentially? What's your like top line recommendation on that? So I think a healthy diet, like we were talking about before, is probably essential to, you know, good skin. Um, but I think for dry skin, the most important thing is the way that you take care of your skin. So if you have dry skin, you want to take five to 10 minute showers with lukewarm, coolish water. Um, you don't want to use any scrubs or rubs. Um, anything that can inflame your skin that will only worsen your skin barrier. Um, but, um, my two favorite moisturizers that I would use, that I do use myself, would be CeraVe. Um, comes in a nice little white jar, CeraVe cream, or um, Amlactin Rapid Repair. Both of them have ceramides in them. Amlactin also has something called lactic acid in it. Um, is a alpha hydroxy acid that helps to hydrate the skin as well um you know in terms of supplements i think that there's a lot of the things out there um i don't know of anything specific that can help specifically with dry skin you know there's a lot of controversy on like fish oils and whether or not they're good for your heart they're not good for your heart i um, and taking that i myself take vitamin c and vitamin d every day especially during this time I think that making sure your vitamin D level is in the normal range is helpful to your immune health and also to your skin health. That's great. Uh, so there are a couple of additional questions coming in, but I, there are on topics that we've already touched. Dr. Uh, Glick is such a fantastic dermatologist, and she's talking about some, some products. What you don't know is that she's actually 83 years old. And, her, and she just her, she, she keeps her skin so perfect that she doesn't she looks like she's 20. Um, Dr. Oslo, do you have any other questions for Dr. Glick? This has been such a great conversation. No, I think, you know, my question, which I think you just touched on a little bit, I think mo most, especially women, um, want to know, they just, the common question probably you get all the time is just give me a regimen. What should I be using in the morning? What should I be using at night? What are the best products to use? But not even just names of products, just what should I be using? And I think you touched on that a lot of the sunscreen, the moisturizer, the retinoids, um, and it probably, and, and your diet. But that's, I think, that was, I think, a big question is just in general, everyone wants to know, give me a regimen. What should I be using? But I think you touched on that a lot. So you can find Dr. Glick uh, online, Dr. J-A-I-M-I-E Glick. And uh, when, we, when we reproduce and rehash the video into a bunch of clips, her name will be on there and you'll be able to see it there. Um, if you missed some of the earlier conversation, uh, Please go back. Our video will be posted on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Maiden Lane Medical. Once again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. 
Uh, thank you for another wonderful Friday conversation and really fantastic questions. Most especially, thank you to Dr. Jamie Glick for joining us. And I hope we can bring you back again to do this another time because there's so much to talk about. And as you said, there's new information coming out all the time. And we're really excited to hear that information about the sunscreens. And you're obviously really up on the literature. So I think it would be fantastic to have you back. Dr. Ostroff, thank you so much again for joining us this week. Uh, I hope everybody has an absolutely wonderful rest of the day Friday, a pleasant, safe, and healthy weekend. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you.